We're taking a break from the welding today to practice another skill that's really important for fabrication, and that's drilling holes in metal. Now, it seems simple enough, but there are a few fundamentals that make the process go a whole lot smoother. So let me break down how I do it. Let's start off by talking about the drill itself. And by drill, I'm talking about a uh, drill bit. Now this is a twist drill, and that's what we're gonna use for all of the drilling in this video. It's the common drill that uh, most people think of when they go to buy drill bits, but it's good to be aware that there are other types like this annular cutter. It doesn't remove any material from the center, so you usually use it in a magnetic drill to uh, make your way through heavy plate pretty quickly, and they're great for that. This right here is a step drill, and this is really good if you're drilling by hand through sheet metal. Not only do you get a variety of different sizes, but it also limits the load of your cut in each step up through it. So, so it's great for that. Now these twist drills might all look the same at face value, but they're not. Look at that point angle is different on the right and the left. So this right here is a 118 degree point on this drill. And that's the most common at just your regular hardware store. The other is a 135 degree point. So what's the difference? Right here on this 118 degree, you have a longer cutting edge, and so it's able to remove more material at once, and this one has a shorter cutting edge. So on that 118 degree drill like this, it's great for wood and plastics, things like that, and also they work well in aluminum and even mild steel. But look at the tip on it right here. It has a standard point, and so the center doesn't have any cutting edge on it and actually has to deform material out to be able to cut it. So that's why they wander around so much. Where in this 135 degree bit, most 135 degree bits have a split point. So there's four cutting edges and those extra cutting edges up at the tip that go to the center keep it from walking around on your metal. And also that 135 degree point has those shorter cutting edges that won't get loaded as much. So I go with 135 degree split point cutters. Now these are both 135 degree split point uh, drills, but they look pretty different. And these are made from different materials. This one right here is high speed steel, just at a bright polish. And this one is a cobalt drill. Now it's actually steel alloyed with cobalt, but uh, these are marketed a lot and they, they can be a good option if you're drilling through something harder like stainless steel, uh, maybe even in cast iron. But generally speaking, high speed steel is is the main uh, material that I use. And all of these drills are made from high-speed steel. So let's talk about the difference, why they look different. This one is a bright polish, and they polish it so that the chips don't stick to it and they can evacuate freely and it doesn't have too much friction. This one right here is titanium nitride coated. So if you're ever at the hardware store and you see titanium drill bits on a package, they're not made of titanium. That wouldn't be a good material choice but they are coated with this titanium nitride to make them last a little longer. Um, this right here is black oxide. It can reduce some of the friction of the chips coming through. And what I've found in general with coatings is I think they're overrated for most uh, kind of just job work. Um, this right here is a combination as black oxide down the flutes. They call them a black and gold drill. I think they work pretty good, but, but again, I wouldn't spend a lot extra for coatings on just uh, regular you know, job drills. Now the first thing to do to get a nice hole is to get it in the right place. Your hole position is pretty important and, and you've probably seen me mark like this with a Sharpie marker and just the speed square and projects, but that it's a pretty rough way to do it. Honestly, it's good enough for a lot of fabrication work, but you have that wide line and uh, you, you can just do your best to try to eyeball it towards the center. Um, as you mark, but it's easy to walk off uh, with that. Now, once again, that's usually good enough. I found that these finer point uh, markers don't hold up very well for metalwork, at least for me. So that's not a good solution if you need something more precise. I usually go with a scribe if I'm trying to get more precise and I can just scratch a line in this. Now, I'm, I'm doing this on aluminum for a reason I'll show you in a minute, but anyway, I really like this little square. It's like a mixture between a combination square and a machinist square. And so I can actually set that uh, length to whatever I need and scribe along the edge right there, just locking it in place. So I use this a lot for laying out holes for fabrication projects where I don't need to be super precise, but I want it to be uh, you know, pretty close. 
So I can lay that there and then scribe a line uh, with uh, just my regular scribe. Now, something else I'm sure you've seen me do on projects, it always uh, creates some excitement in the comments section, is use just a cheap set of calipers. There's, a, you know, there are some that are made to do this, but they cost more than these cheap ones that work. And that describes the line. But look right here, it's hard to tell where the line you made is versus you know, just other scratches that are on the material. So if you're not doing some good bookkeeping and, and watching your line, it's easy to lose it. And that's where some of this layout fluid comes in handy. Now this is bordering on machinist territory right here, uh, probably beyond most fabrication projects, but sometimes you want to get something really precise. And this is the, this is the way to do it really is just to measure it out and mark it with layout fluid. And you can scribe really lightly. So you don't really have to gouge into your material as much as you do if you're describing directly on the face. Now, if you don't have layout fluid, uh, you, you can also just color with a marker and that can help keep track of it, but it doesn't work as well because you don't have the same thickness. It just, just doesn't hold up, but it does fill in the other scratches. So it, it keeps track of which one you just made. Now, all of this just wipes off with some acetone after, so you don't need to worry about that on your projects. Once it's marked out, center punching is essential to be able to hit your position and also to uh, keep your drill from wandering, especially if you're hand drilling. So I use these center punches right here, just the old school style, 90 degree point, and that works pretty well on most materials, aluminum, steel, other metals and it gives me a good point for it to follow. There are also automatic center punches like this one right here. And this you just press and it uh, clicks and makes your dimple like that. They can slide around a little bit. So I, I like the old fashioned ones better. Now I'll just mention center drills right here. These are rigid drills that can make a little indentation to follow. You could use these on a drill press for fabrication projects, but I hardly ever do. I really only use them for machining and I use them a lot on uh, machining type projects. So just be aware of those. Now let's talk about work holding. You have these slots that are in a typical drill press table and there are different styles, but usually there's some sort of slot there. And a lot of people will just hold their material by hand, but if the drill catches it and it rotates around, that's like a swinging knife. So I don't really like that. Now they sell clamps that'll uh, go directly in those slots. I find those to be cumbersome. And since I had a bunch of fixer table hardware, I just drilled five eighths inch holes in my table and I use them to hold my material in place just like that and it keeps everything locked in. It also gives me the option if I just wanna add an anti-rotation to it, I can use these stops right here and that, uh, well, I wouldn't recommend holding it by hand. If, if you were to do that, it gives you at least some insurance. So um, that is uh, another option there. Now the drill press vise is going to be the bread and butter of drilling smaller pieces. And the challenge with these though is holding them in place because yeah, you can run bolts through those holes and through the slots, but then you have to reposition and pull them in and out. And it's really kind of a hassle when you're trying to be productive. And so this is where I use those clamps more than any other place. So once I have my part locked in there, and I line it up right under my drill. So I, I know it's in the right position. It'll just kind of find it with that center punch there. I can just use the clamp to actually clamp the vise right in place. And that works pretty well for me. Next, I need to set my speed. Now I'm working on a drill press here that has belts I need to move around. Some of them are variable speed. And on a hand drill, you might just have your high and low range. But the question is what to set your speed to. Now there are a bunch of tables you can do math on in a big manual like this, but I've found that a simple rule of thumb helps me out to just do it on the fly in the shop. So I start with a baseline and that's 700 RPM for a half inch hole in mild steel. Next, I take that and I adjust for the size of hole I'm drilling. So if I'm drilling a smaller hole, it needs to spin faster because those outer edges don't move as far for every revolution. So if I was moving from a half inch to a quarter inch hole, I'd double it, for example. After that, I adjust for my material. If I'm drilling in something soft like aluminum, I just double the speed. If it's something harder than the mild steel, like stainless steel, I cut it in half. 
Now, before I drill my hole, I'm going to put on some cutting lubricant. And there are a lot of different types to use, and I've tried a lot of them. I've been liking this Anchor Lube water-based uh, lubricant. They sent it out to me at the middle of last year, and I've been using it since. And, and it stays in place. It's easy to clean off, and it doesn't smoke like the oil-based stuff. Now, I'm working my way through here, and I'm just watching the swore for the chips coming off to uh, gauge how quickly I progress down through my material. And I want to have some curl and some length to them. I don't necessarily need them to wrap around the drill like they are. Um, but if you notice, they're really thin, and we'll look at it afterwards. And that indicates that it's not uh, really loading it very heavily. And, and with this material, it'd just be hard to avoid. Uh, for any of you actual machinists out there watching this, I'd love to know what you look for in the chips coming off of a, a drilled hole and, and what that tells you. But this tells me that I probably could have uh, rotated a little bit faster, higher RPM, and maybe progressed a little more slowly through the material. But again, I'd love love to know uh, from, from those of you who are machinists down in the comments. Now, here is the hole, and it came out nice and clean. Uh, it usually does with aluminum. Let's go ahead and do some drilling in steel. Now, I am moving at the same RPM here through steel with half the size of drill that I was in aluminum. And that works out about right from my experience. So this right here is running about 1,400 or 1,500 RPM for mild steel. Once again, that's double that half inch baseline that I had because I'm drilling a quarter inch hole. And I also doubled that for the aluminum because I was drilling the same size hole in aluminum. Now here I'm running a half inch diameter hole and so I've cut the speed in half compared to the quarter inch hole that I just uh, worked my way through. And that seems to work out just about right for me, you know, right around 700 RPM, whatever the notch was that's closest to that. And notice I'm getting a little bit of curl to most of my uh, chips or the swarf as it comes off. And I might get a couple longer ones like a spring, but generally speaking, they're breaking. And so I, I feel pretty good about this speed and the rate that I'm working through here. Now let's go ahead and uh, look a little closer at some of that swarf. And notice, even when it's continuous, it's thin and breaks apart easily. So I, I feel pretty good about that. Now the holes themselves are pretty clean, in my opinion, for uh, the drill that we're working with. Now one more hole here on stainless steel. And in this case, I cut the speed down to half what I'd be running in mild steel. And that works out pretty well for me. It made its way right through. This was a cobalt uh, drill and the same uh, lubricant. Now, now, there are some burrs that I need to remove after I drill any hole. So the job isn't uh, necessarily done unless you're going to clamp it in a, you know, a bolted fit up and you don't want to worry about it. But usually I like to deburr. And so this right here is the easiest way I've found to do it just with a countersink right in a cordless drill, keep that handy, right by your machine, and you're ready to go and off to the races. And you know, even when it isn't visible, I think it's just good craftsmanship to always deburr and put a, put a slight chamfer on your holes there. It's not very deep, but it, it just gives a clean uh, look and keeps you from getting cut. Another option that you can use is just a deburr knife like this. I, I mean, one of these belongs in every metalworking shop and, and they work pretty well to cut the burr off, but, but I don't think you get quite the same finish that you do with the countersink. And this works especially well on aluminum. I, I like it for that uh, as well. So, you know, you make a hole like this and that looks you know, really nice and clean. Now, this is actually one of the topics in my Fabrication 101 course on my website. If you are just learning welding and fabrication and you wanna pick it up a lot faster than you can by just watching videos, be sure to check those out. If you enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting that thumbs up below and we'll see you next time.